Okay, my recording is starting. Hello, everybody. Welcome in. Week number five. Yes, pushing forward. Uh, at the end of this week, you'll be basically halfway there. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yes, welcome back to uh, ME2001. Um, today, we're going to continue our discussion on force moment relationships. And I will remind you that you have homework number three, which is due on Wednesday, which is on calculation of moments in both two dimensional and three dimensional space. So, do that. Okay. Um, funny meme here. There you go. We needed new fresh memes today. There are special requests by Paige. So there you go. New meme, fresh off the press. And by press, I mean I stole it from the internet. Okay. Let us then continue where we left off. Okay. So just a reminder for last week. We were discussing moments, uh, and generally, if you're in a three-dimensional space, it's like X, Y, and Z, and you're centered at some point, let's call it point O, and you have another point that exists out in space over here, let's call it point A, and you've got a force that's acting at that particular location, so we call this FA. Then we would say that the moment um, about O from force at A is the moment at O is equal to the position vector which arrives at A from O crossed with the force at A. So we'll remind ourselves what that position vector is. The position vector which arrives at A from O is the position vector R arriving at A from O. All right. We uh, had a lot of discussion about what this mathematical term here is, this cross product. And basically the idea is that the magnitude of this particular cross product is the magnitude of each of those individual vectors multiplied together, multiplied by the sine of the angle between them. And then the direction follows the right hand rule. So if we wanted to sort of like show what that moment might look like on this uh, particular three-dimensional space, well, this is going to be a vector. And that vector is going to be perpendicular to the plane that contains the force Fa and the position vector Rao. So your resulting moment is going to be, if I thought about the right-hand rule, standing at point O, sticking my arm in the direction of R and curling my fingers in the direction of F, I'm going to imagine that the resulting moment occurring at point O here looks something like that. We're drawing a double arrow for the moment, and this is to indicate that we're having like some axis of rotation, though it's not necessarily rotating. We have some axis of uh, twisting about that particular direction of that vector. So if I stuck my arm in the direction of R, curled my fingers in the direction of F, my thumb would stick in the point or in the direction of the moment at O. We use the double arrow to sort of indicate that this is kind of a sort of a curling, sort of torquing motion about this particular axis here. Okay, So that's uh, what we dove in on last week. Generally, we said that you can write your position vector as something like some component in X plus some component in Y plus some component in Z. We did this for our forces. We can similarly do it for this position vector. And also, you can write your force in terms of rectangular components. If you were to set it up in this manner, and you'll have a lot of practice doing this on the homework if you haven't already done it, then the moment we sort of had a trick for calculating this and we're using sort of this like determinant form to separate the various components as well as the i, j, and k directions. We set up something that looked like this to sort of help us keep track of the calculations of the moments using sort of our um, diagonal multiplication where this here is our x, our y, Rz, fx, 
F Y and F Z. So we can go through and we know that if we're going with this particular direction for our uh, multiplication, that that's going to give us positive entries. And if we're going this way, we're generally going to get negative entries. So this is a way for us to sort of quickly calculate the moment. Hopefully you've worked your way at least through a little bit of the homework and are comfortable doing something like this. I guarantee you'll have to do something like this on your next test. OK, so that's about where we left off last week. Did a lot of examples, both um, the traditional method here, and I kind of showed you a shortcut method for calculating moments quickly in 2D if you happen to know line of action of force. And hopefully we're comfortable now at least doing some calculations of moments. I want to move on now to some more advanced topics for moments. And we're going to make our way specifically through a new mathematical topic and then introduce contributions of moments about a, a particular axis of interest. So I need to <clears throat> introduce another mathematical topic here, and that is the scalar product. And then you will use that idea to help us with some more advanced calculations of, of moments going forward. So next topic is a math topic, and that is scalar products. OK. Some of you maybe have seen scalar products already. If you're in kind of some of the advanced calculus classes, I think they talk about this a little bit. But the scalar product of two vectors is the following. So this is an important idea, is that the scalar product of two vectors results in a scalar value. Now this is different from the cross product. Remember the cross product between two vectors results in a vector. Here the scalar product of two vectors re results in a scalar value. And this is typically written as if you have two vectors in space, P, here's the dot with Q. We would call this the dot product or the scalar product. Just make a note here that this is sometimes called the dot product. Okay, for obvious reasons, because you know this is a, a big dot. This is equal to the magnitude of P multiplied by the magnitude of Q times the cosine of the angle between them. Don't get this confused with your cross product magnitude, which is magnitude of P, magnitude of Q, sine angle between. All right. So what this is physically, this is the magnitude of the projection of P onto Q. I'm going to draw some pictures here in just a second, and I'll explain what I mean by that. It'll make a little bit more sense if we have this in sort of picture form. So let's say we have two vectors emanating from a point in space. Let's call this here vector P. And we'll call this here vector Q. We'll say that there's an angle between them. That's the angle theta. Then the dot product of P and Q is P dot Q here. 
it's the magnitude of the projection of P onto Q. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we thought about like a triangle that existed here, which is a right triangle, between P and the vector Q, then P dot Q is simply the projection of P onto Q, something like that. This is P dot Q, the projection of P onto Q. Dr. Hart. Question. Uh, I just want to clarify something, and that projection would be making uh, a perpendicular angle with Q, right? Right, so this this here would be like a perpendicular direction, right? And be clear that this is not a vector. This is just the magnitude of that side length of the triangle. Okay. Basically like the magnitude of the leg of that triangle. All right couple of properties of this guy. Scalar products <clears throat> are commutative. I think I have cumulative <laughs> written in your notes. It should be commutative. There's an error in your notes that says cumulative. <laughs> that is incorrect. So P dotted with Q is equal to Q dotted with P. Right? <clears throat> if I wanted to think of the analogy here in this figure, if I thought about dotting Q into P, then this would kind of come down at like a right angle here. And this length here, which is not quite to the full tip of P, is Q dotted onto P. And both of those guys would have the same length. All right. Finally, they are distributive. And what I mean by that is P dotted with, let's say some vector Q1 plus some vector Q2 is equal to P dotted with Q1 plus P dotted with Q2. There's a picture of this in your notes. Um, it's a little bit cumbersome for me to try to draw with um, any accuracy. But the picture in your notes kind of explains this guy a little bit better. OK, if we were to think about doing this or executing this math in um, sort of rectangular components. Then you'd have something like P dotted with Q is equal to, if we're writing these vectors in their rectangular form, this would be PXI plus PYJ plus PZK dotted with QXI hat plus QY j hat plus q z k hat and you could work your way through all the math here all right so we could distribute all these things to each of the individual pieces i could like distribute this guy to this guy this guy to this guy this guy to this guy 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through up. Okay. We'll also make a note that something like i hat dotted with i hat is going to be equal to one. Okay. This is a little bit different than the cross product because <clears throat> this dotted with this, both of them have magnitude of one. So we'll just remind you that this is like one times one times the cosine of the angle between them, which is zero. And the cosine of zero obviously is one. So that's how I dot I is equal to one. And similarly, if you have something that's 90 degrees from that, I dot J is equal to zero. That's pretty obviously demonstrated with something like one times one times cosine of the angle between I and J. We know that those unit vectors are 90 degrees from each other. And cosine of the angle 90 degrees is zero. So we have zero. And so if we do something like PXI dotted with QXI, well, both of those guys are kind of pointing in the I direction. Right? So the resulting magnitude of PXI dotted with QXI is just going to be P times PX times QX. If we thought about something like PXI hat times QYJ hat, well, the result of that would be something like PX times QY times the cosine of the angle between I hat and J hat, which is zero. So this guy would result in a zero. Right? So the only things that really persist through this dot product execution, if we were to think about it, is something like PXI dotted with QXI, PYJ dotted with QYJ, PZK dotted with QZK. So those are the only guys that really remain after this. P dotted with Q is equal to PXQX plus PYQY plus PZQZ. The projection of one vector onto the other, if you have them in rectangular coordinates, results in a scalar value. It's the magnitude of the projection of one vector onto the other, which is just the individual components of those individual vectors multiplied together and then summed over i, j, and k. All right. So here's a nice result. All right, well, why is this particularly useful? Well, there's a lot of situations that arise where you happen to know kind of uh, the magnitudes of the individual vectors and maybe where they're sort of pointing, but you don't necessarily know the angle between them in space. This happens a lot with like guy wires that are sort of holding down a tower, for instance. Okay, what's the angle between those two guy wires or what angle does that guy wire make with the ground? All right, those are some things that you might want to calculate quickly. And we can do that using some of these tricks of, of vector products. OK, so remember. The P dotted with Q is the magnitude of P. Multiplied by the magnitude of Q. Multiplied by cosine of the angle between them. And we've also shown that this is equal to PXQX plus PYQY plus PZQZ. Okay. So if we kind of just look at this second equation here, this guy here, you can rearrange that to solve for the angle between two particular vectors. The cosine of the angle between two particular vectors is the following. All divided by 
the magnitude of vector P multiplied by the magnitude of the vector Q. Okay, so this is a nice kind of result that occurs for math associated with the dot product or the vector product as it's called. <clears throat> okay, let's look at a quick example that uses this. Um, it's could be potentially useful in your life. Volleyball nets. Yes, not probably going to be used anytime soon. Um, here we want to find the angle between guy wires AB and AC for this particular volleyball net. Okay, so here's AB. And AC. I was going to copy this picture over. OK, so let's do this. The way that we want to go about this is to think that there's a kind of a position vector that points from A to B and a position vector that points from A to C. Then we can sort of use some of the tricks with our scalar product or a dot product to help us determine what's the angle between the two. So what we're really asking here is, OK, we've got this vector that exists here that's pointing from A to C. We've got a vector that exists here that's pointing from A to B. I'm going to call this the position vector, which arrives at B from A. And I'm going to call this guy here the position vector, which arrives at C from A. And then the angle that exists between those two guys, we can sort of see on the figure here, is this angle. And this is the angle of interest that I care about, it's the angle theta. It's sort of the angle that I want to know in this problem. Okay, I'm going to get rid of a little bit of the clutter here. And with that idea in mind, we're going to use um, scalar product or dot product information that we generally have. And that is that the cosine of the angle theta is going to be something like Px Qx plus PY, QY, plus PZ, QZ, all over the magnitude of P times the magnitude of Q. That's sort of what I'm after here. So let's let the position vector that arrives at B from A. Let's let that be my vector P. I mean, we're we'll just kind of like renaming this or kind of using some nomenclature or sort of trying to get back to what we just taught a second ago. So position vector arriving at B from A. 
All right, well, if I do this in rectangular components here, I, I see that I'm arriving at this location B from this position A. So I got to think about how far I'm traveling in each one of the general directions to get from A to B. OK, so first I'll look at the X direction. We'll see here that I've got to go back 6.5 feet. So it's going to be something like negative 6.5 I hat. Next, I want to think about my Y direction going from A to B. I've got to go down this eight feet here. So this is going to be minus eight J hat. And finally, my Z dimension going from A to B looks like is a positive two feet here. So plus two K hat. This is feet. Let's call my position vector arriving at C from A. Let's call this our vector Q. It's kind of keeping with our analogy here. If I can bring this up just a touch. Okay. Here we see for the X direction, I'm not really traveling anywhere. Point A and C sort of lie in, on, lie in the same coordinate of X. So I don't have to travel anywhere to go from A to C. So I'll say zero I hat just for clarity. I've again got to go in the Y direction. I've got to go down my eight feet. And the Z direction, which is this general direction here, looks like I've got to go out six feet from A to get to B. I'll need the magnitudes of each one of these individual vectors. So let's go through that now. Magnitude of P, magnitude of Q. Remember the magnitude of a vector is the square root of the sum of the squares of the components that make up that vector. So here we're going to have something like the square root of negative 6.5 squared plus negative 8 squared plus Two squared. You work through this, you'll get that the magnitude of P here is a, is 10.5 feet. I can do sort of a similar thing with my other vector. Just for completeness, I'll say zero squared plus negative eight squared plus six squared. 64 plus 36 squared is square root of 100, which is 10 feet. Now back to my general equation. I'm ready here to plug everything in and calculate the cosine of the angle between. So here we'll have cosine is px. Let's separate the numerator and the denominator here. The numerator px times qx. All right, well, here's px negative 6.5. Here's qx zero. plus PYQY, I mean, negative eight, negative eight, plus PZQZ, here that's two times six, all over the product of the magnitudes of the two individual vectors. On the denominator here, I have 10.5 multiplied by 10. You work through the math here, something like 76 um, 105.
and then do a inverse cosine to calculate that your angle theta here between these two particular guy wires 43.6 degrees. All right. So a, a nice little technique there. All right, let's continue on. I'm going to teach you one more little trick or one more little technique, which is sort of just a combination of two techniques that we've already learned or talked about. And that is the technique that's the scalar triple product. OK, so the general definition here. Looks like you have three vectors. S, P, and Q. is simply S dotted with the cross product of P and Q. There's your scalar triple product. OK, notice here that this will become a vector. We know from the cross product that one vector crossed with another vector results in a vector. So P crossed with Q will give us a vector. And we execute that first since it's in parentheses. And then the outer bit, S dotted with our new vector that we create, the result of this will be a scalar. Bit a bit of a physical interpretation here. Uh, is that if you had three vectors, this is the volume of a what's known as a parallelopiped. I got to spell this right. Formed with P, Q, and S. All right, if I were to sort of sketch what this actually looks like, here we've got a point in space where all three of these guys are emanating. Let's call this P. Let's call this S. And sort of backwards into the page is Q. Now, a parallel pipette is thinking about these three vectors as like the nexus of a shape that is formed that has a rectangular kind of feel to it. So if I thought about the plane that contains S and P, and I sort of like continued with that particular plane, it might look something like that. And then if I thought about projecting that backwards into the plane that contains Q and S, 
it might look something like this. Okay, so here is like the parallel pipette that's formed by P, Q, and S. So the internal volume of this, interestingly, is S dotted with P crossed Q. So it, it could have a very like irregular shape. So there's a lot of uses in like material science where crystal planes and um, atoms that make up a crystal structure have a certain orientation with respect to each other that's repeatable over and over and over. So if you can sort of use vectors to define the positions of each one of the individual molecules, you can then use the scalar triple product between those three position vectors to help you determine what's the volume of space between, let's say, a bunch of molecules that have this kind of regular geometric pattern. It's kind of an interesting idea. All right. You could write out all the components here um, if you wanted, and I do so in the notes. So let's go ahead and, and do that here. This is Sx multiplied by Pyqz minus Pzqy plus, oh boy, Sy times Pz Qx minus Px. Qz plus Sz times Px Qy minus Py Qx. And this is a bit much to remember, but looks very similar to your determinant form of your moment calculation. So determinant form This one's a bit easier to remember. where all of these are scalar values. And you kind of execute the same process here that you would for your traditional cross product, right? So things kind of down and to the right are positive. And so this diagonal that I've sort of drawn here would be like this particular piece of that sort of triple product fully written out. And if we thought about, you know, maybe going the other way with one of our components later down the line, S, Z, P, Y, Q, X. Here's S, Z, P, Y, and Q, X. And we have a negative sign because we're going down into the left. It's a very similar strategy for how you might calculate your, um, your moments. So we can be pretty explicit about this. Sx, Pzqy, Sx, Pzqy. Here we have Sy, Px, Qz. 
S Y P X Q Z, and then S Z P Y Q X, S Z P Y Q X. So those are all of our terms sort of accounted for using sort of that like determinant form of um, the scalar triple product here. I'm going to erase some of these lines so that you can sort of <laughs> actually read this. OK. Why does this have anything to do with moments? You know, I thought we were in a lecture about moments and calculating the effect of a moment. Yeah, OK, valid question. What does this have anything to do with moments? Well, <clears throat> when we are calculating moments, the moment between, you know, a position vector and a force vector gave us a vector in a particular direction. and if we were interested in this particular axis, which would be the axis of this particular moment, then we'd be fine with everything that we've just talked about so far. However, there are some certain situations where the axis about which you are trying to rotate or which you wish to rotate about is not necessarily the axis about which the moment is calculated. So what I'm trying to say is, Sometimes we wish to know how much the moment from a certain force is trying to twist about not the axis about which the moment is upon, but about some alternative axis. So let's draw this in picture form and I'll sort of explain what I mean. And the headline here is moment of a force about an arbitrary axis. So we know what a typical moment calculation in space looks like. We drew this at the beginning of the lecture. X, Y, and Z. We had some point that exists out here in space. That's point A. Our origin, we're saying, is at location O. There's a position vector that points to A from O. Let's call this the position vector, which arrives at A from O. And we have a force that's acting at point A. The moment that's generated from my position vector cross with my force, we know looks something like this. All right, thinking about <clears throat> the plane that exists here. with the vector R and the vector FA. This moment here, which we'll label as MO, would be perpendicular to the plane containing FA and RAO, right? We sort of know that from our previous discussion on moments. Okay, so we know that this moment is perpendicular to that particular plane. That's sort of the definition for our moments. It's a vector that comes out perpendicular to the plane containing these two particular forces. All right, we know that that is true. And that moment, it, you're generating some twist about like an axis that is coincident with this particular moment. So moment axis. Okay. But there's a lot of situations where you're actually creating a moment about some moment axis. Let's say that's this moment axis here. But because of the way that your force and your position vector are aligned, your moment that you're generating is not perfectly coincident with an axis that you're actually interested in rotating about. Let me give you an example. 
So remember our our lug wrench example, where we had this particular guy. My very, very amazing picture. And we had the forces that were here and here. And they're sort of generating, if we think about the position vectors to each one of these forces, they're generating a moment about the axis that's along this particular line, right? OK. Now, we could calculate what that moment is, and that's great. Everything here happens to be all hunky dory, you know? But what if my forces weren't sort of like perfectly aligned with this perpendicular rod? What if for some reason they were, you know, applied in such a way that this person's hands are not, you know, applying them perfectly? Let's say that someone is applying a force that's not necessarily perfectly perpendicular to this particular apparatus. OK, well, then the moment that's generated from these particular guys is not perfectly aligned with the torquing axis of that particular wrench. OK, and so I'm most interested in the moment that's generated about this longitudinal axis here of this piece. But if for some reason the force that I'm applying or the distance that it's located away from my particular point of interest is not perfectly perpendicular or perfectly in the plane of interest, then the moment that I generate is going to be not necessarily coincident with the axis of interest. OK, and so I want to know how much the moment that I'm actually generating is acting along this particular axis. And that's what I'm after here. OK, so let's put some words to that. Sometimes. The axis of interest. And the moment axis. are not the same. OK. So. If. The axis of interest. Is along. A unit vector. Lambda, we know how to make these. Then the contribution of the moment along an axis aligned with Lambda is the projection of the moment that you generated into that axis. Or you could write it the other way. OK, it's a lot of words there, a lot of stuff that I just wrote down. I want to talk about this a little bit using sort of the figure that I generated previously, and then we'll sort of break and pick this idea up tomorrow. I'm applying some torque. It's applying it along some particular moment axis. Maybe that axis is not necessarily aligned with the axis that I care about, right? So my example here, this force in this position vector 
when you execute your cross product are generating this moment. Right. But if there's another axis that I really care about that exists, let's say it's some axis that exists here. And it's defined by a unit vector given by lambda. OK. Then the amount that this particular moment. Acts on an axis defined by lambda is the projection of this particular moment onto that axis. That would give me an indication of how much my moment acts to create twist about the axis aligned with lambda. I'm dotting its contribution into that direction. I'm projecting that moment's contribution into that axis using the dot product. OK. Uh, we'll leave it here and we'll pick this up uh, tomorrow. Give you something to think about when you're sleeping on your pillow. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming.